Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining the first lecture in our distinguished lecture series of journal Lawrence S. Kutter at the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. The consortium is aligned with the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, Air <coughs> University Press, Alabama. I'm Indu Saxena, the host of this lecture, and we have a famous and renowned political scientist. Our eminent speaker of this first lecture is Professor Richard Ned Libo. Professor Libo, we are honored to have you at our platform. Thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. So today's, uh, our lecture is focused on international relation theories and modern warfare. As it, uh, we all know, we are been witnessing this horrible events in Europe and the Ukraine war, it has been one month. And uh, we don't see the, how it, uh, this uh, war will end. So let's uh, have some answers from our professor for this, so they, there may be a, a way out for peace. Before- Thank, yeah. th thank right. you very much for your introduction. Um, I, I don't think I can give you any answers. Uh, I can give you some thoughts and speculation. Alas, I have no crystal ball. Uh, I've been asked to talk to you, however, about uh, what, if anything, theories of international relations have to say about this war. Uh, our theories tend to address uh, two things, uh, uh, the causes of war, why they break out or why they don't, and the consequences uh, of wars. So I will speak uh, to those two topics. I will do my very best to limit my remarks to 30 minutes which is a considerable challenge uh, given the scope of what I have been asked to cover. Um, in looking at what many analysts uh, have argued are the causes of war, I'm going to divide them into three generic headings. Uh, the first has to do with what the West did or didn't do. Uh, this rests on the theory, uh, most notably argued by my former student, John Mearsheimer, uh, that it was uh, the West that loomed largest in Putin, Putin's calculations. And if we had um, behaved differently, uh, war might have been averted. That's the the first kind of explanation that is being offered. Uh, the second uh, has to do with uh, Ukraine. And here, the principal argument is that um, uh, Putin is both attracted and feels compelled to invade Ukraine, uh, attracted because he believes that Ukraine is part of Russia and Ukrainians would welcome reunification. And the compelled argument, which is very different, um, is that uh, a democratic state on the borders of Russia that was once part of Russia, whose people speak a language that most Russians can understand, uh, poses a threat to the authoritarian regime uh, that Putin has put in place. Uh, the third uh, generic set of explanations pertains to Putin himself. It rests on the argument that had someone else been leader of Russia, this never would have happened, that to understand the war, we need to look at Putin and what makes him tick. Uh, each of these arguments uh, can be rooted in different theories of international relations. Although to be clear, the talking heads who advance these respective arguments are not doing this because uh, 
for the most part, they tend to be journalists or foreign policy analysts, not international relations researchers. But we're international relations theorists, so we're going to look at it from this foundational perspective, if you like. So let's start <clears throat> with the West. And I, it's so interesting here because we have diametrically opposed arguments by those who focus on the West. The first argument is that the West failed to deter Putin. And so here we have an argument that is uh, uh, deeply rooted in deterrence theory, uh, which believes that it is uh, possible to prevent actions you don't want by making threats, and that this works because in effect, you're manipulating the cost calculus of the target state, huh? that they undertake a rational cost calculus. They ask themselves, what will I gain? What's the risk in doing this? And by threatening to punish them or prevent them from carrying out the action, you're in effect increasing the cost to them of, in this case, an invasion, uh, and making it clear that they won't gain much from it. So that's the assumption of deterrence theory. And those uh, who anchor their arguments in deterrence theory uh, point to the ways in which the West either didn't exercise deterrence well or failed to exercise deterrence, uh, did very little in response to the Russian attack on Georgia, the Russian occupation of the Crimea, uh, and of course, Russian actions in Syria, and also the penetration of so-called volunteers but in fact, uh, Russian soldiers into Eastern regions of Ukraine, most notably uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, the opposite argument that focuses on the West is not that the West <laughs> did too little, but that the West did too much. That by extending NATO uh, to the East, by allowing uh, countries to join that were formerly parts of the Soviet Union, and by at least some people, and here notably Hillary Clinton, uh, raising the prospect of Ukraine uh, joining NATO, uh, the West seriously threatened Putin and Russia, that any Russian leader would conclude that the West harbored aggressive intentions, that it could not be allowed to extend itself any further, that the only action available to Putin was to invade uh, Ukraine. So this kind of argument is your standard realist argument that states put their security first. If they feel backed into a corner, uh, they're likely to resort to military force to defend their vital interest. Uh, personally, I'm not persuaded by either of these arguments in the case of Ukraine. And some of you may know if you've read uh, my writings on deterrence that I'm not persuaded by deterrence either that we know, for example, during the Cold War, but in many cases, historically involving other states, uh, that deterrence is very much a hit or miss uh, strategy, that it can affect the cost calculus of adversaries in a way the very opposite of what you intend. Uh, primarily by making threats, you convince people to reframe what's at stake to the extent to which they may have been focusing on what they considered national interest, now they focus on threats and not giving in to them for fear that if they do, new and greater demands will follow. Uh, we 
can document this in numerous uh, cases. Uh, we also know, and this will become relevant when I talk about uh, uh, Putin, that uh, deterrence, even when its conditions are met, frequently fails and fails because leaders are so focused on the combination of domestic and or foreign threats they face that they convince themselves in spite of all evidence to the contrary, that they will succeed. In effect, they are blind to the deterrent efforts of an adversary and look for ways of explaining them away. So in the case of Ukraine, uh, you, you can make an argument that uh, the West did not practice deterrence uh, and that uh, Putin uh, thought that there was very little likelihood of uh, the West um, intervening, uh, that at most they would slap his wrist and Russia's wrist by imposing minimal sanctions which were easily circumvented. Um, I think in this case, there is some truth uh, to the argument uh, and add to it the extent to which Germany in particular became dependent on um, Russian energy supplies. So uh, while I'm not a supporter of deterrence, I do think that the failure to practice deterrence either in the long term or in the immediate run up to the invasion of Ukraine um, convinced Putin that the cost would be low. But here's where I, different, I differ from uh, deterrence theorist. I, I don't believe that it was a decisive factor, merely a contributing factor in Putin's decision. I believe he was committed to attack Ukraine for other reasons. He didn't see it, as deterrence theorists would argue, a mere target of opportunity. I think he was driven to do it and probably would have done it either way. Now, this second part of the argument that the West threatened uh, Putin, um, here I count myself among those who from the time the Soviet Union collapsed, argued that the West should not extend NATO to the East. And indeed, we know that at least two, two American presidents made the promise that they would not, uh, which was violated. However, uh, NATO has not stationed uh, American, German, or British forces until after the invasion in these Eastern countries. It has helped them with defensive measures. Uh, they've done nothing in terms of their military size or weaponry that would uh, give them any capability of carrying out an attack on Russia. So the argument that Putin felt threatened in a military sense uh, just doesn't wash. Now, he may have felt threatened in a political sense, but that's very different. And I'll come to this when we discuss uh, uh, internal politics of Russia and Putin in particular. So it, where this leaves us is that the deterrence argument uh, at best uh, can be considered an enabling factor, uh, but not um, a causal one. And that realist arguments about the balance of power uh, also tell us uh, very little uh, that's relevant here uh, because there was no, as we'll see, real estimate of the balance of power made by the Soviet side. Uh, the poor performance of the Russian army, the effective defense put up by Ukrainians uh, suggests that the Russian side uh, never undertook a serious 
uh, calculus or calculation of the balance of power, which is the first thing that realists assume uh, would be the case. Let's now turn to Ukraine. And here, um, I think we've, we've seen uh, the development of a country and political system which is uh, directly threatening to Putin in both a political and ideological sense. And the two are, of course, closely connected. The ideological sense is that unlike Belarus, uh, where uh, Lukashenko is basically a puppet ruler with his country more and more dependent on Russia, Ukraine has become more and more independent. Uh, it's also many sizes larger and more populous uh, than Belarus. It managed to get rid of its uh, pro-Russian ruler. It's in the process of establishing, uh, surprisingly so, uh, successful democracy, uh, one that under the current leadership of Zelensky appears committed to liberal democratic values. This has to stick in the craw of a Soviet leader and a Soviet leader who, and we'll come to him in a moment, believes that his mission is to recreate a powerful Russian state on the model of the former Soviet Union. And here, the most important step is reincorporating Ukraine uh, into Russia. So Ukrainian nationalism and liberalism uh, violate uh, Putin's vision uh, and his goals. They also threaten him politically. We know that uh, well, we don't really have effective opinion polls in Russia, but we do know from all kinds of sources and from uh, those who have the pulse of Russia and write on the subject, uh, that support for Putin has diminished considerably. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that also enabled uh, Putin's uh, occupation of Crimea was his belief that it would play well with Russians, that it would increase rather than diminish his support. And there's reason to believe that that's what it did. And of course it was uh, uh, an operation that did cause many lives, but most of them not of the Russian soldiers who were attacking, but of civilians. Uh, with respect to uh, Ukraine, uh, here I really believe that um, he convinced himself that it would be another walkover. And before coming to the reasons for this, um, I, I wanna give the evidence which uh, journalists have already written extensively about. Uh, we know that Russian soldiers were told they were only on training missions, uh, that these uh, forces were inadequately prepared inadequately trained, didn't exploit what tactical opportunities developed in the early days of the invasion, uh, didn't have an effective uh, strategy, in effect behaved as if it was uh, not a serious occupation uh, or serious uh, conflict. The model was Crimea and perhaps the occupation of Czechoslovakia uh, before that to suppress the Prague Spring, uh, which was a relatively bloodless operation carried out by uh, Brezhnev when in the days of the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, how could such a thing uh, come to pass? And here, I think we have to look at uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, all the people who have uh, written about him stress the extent to which he is a nationalist uh, who believes Russia has a holy mission, uh, that he sees himself as the direct descendants of uh, 
Stalin, Lenin, and the czars, all of whom sought to expand or recreate the power of the state uh, that they now headed. Uh, all of them were willing to use force in the most brutal ways to do this. And all of them paid little heed to the cost because in their minds, the end justified the means. Uh, this is Putin in a nutshell. Now we know, and here I refer to my own work between peace and war, uh, my work with uh, Janice Stein and Bob Jervis, alas, the late Bob Jervis in psychology and deterrence and my book with Janice Stein on We All Lost the Cold War and uh, her work on the Middle East, that um, leaders who feel deeply committed uh, to carry out risky actions, convince themselves that they will succeed. And in doing so, they become relatively immune to information that threatens their goals. Uh, this problem uh, was perfectly evident in the American invasion of Iraq, huh? where the feedback networks were rigged uh, to give the Bush administration the intelligence and in quotes that it wanted uh, to dismiss uh, all uh, disagreement and uh, basically to pretend that the occupation of Iraq would be a walkover. Uh, Putin has carried this to yet another level. Uh, and it's not surprising because he has set up the kind of authoritarian regime where he interacts with a very small number of people, all of them either dedicated or afraid of him, none of them willing to contradict him in any way or to present him with information that would uh, appear to contradict the feasibility of his domestic or foreign policy goals. Uh, he has created a fictional world for himself. And I think really believed, and nobody told him to the contrary, that Ukrainians, instead of firing at Russian invaders, would place flowers in the gun barrels of their rifles and tanks, that this would be a costless operation and that it would be a first step or yet another, a big step toward the attainment of his goal of a strengthened uh, Russia. Uh, we know he's on record saying on multiple occasions that the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union in contrast to those of us who believe that it was one of the best things that happened in the 20th century. So to understand what happened, we have to understand Putin, the cultural setting in which he arose and the domestic political structure in which he governs. Uh, while some of these other factors may have been contributing factors, it was overwhelmingly uh, Putin's uh, uh, substantively irrational goals and instrumentally irrational policy uh, that led to this war. So this is a case that stands uh, in sharp contradiction to realist and rationalist theories of war. Uh, but I must say uh, very much uh, uh, in line with the kinds of arguments that Stein and I make in our critique of deterrence and that I advance as the principal causes of war in my cultural theory of international relations and why nations fight. Uh, now, uh, we also have to consider the outcome of wars. Uh, and here, uh, there are two levels to the problem. Uh, first is the particular outcome of this war. And uh, clearly, as I said at the beginning, we don't know. We could um, consider several different pathways. Uh, the Ukrainians 
could in the long term expel the Russians. War could become so expensive and stalemated on both sides that uh, something has to be done. And here Putin could either escalate or seek a di diplomatic solution. I suspect he'd be more likely to escalate than to uh, withdraw as part of a diplomatic settlement because I think he's uh, irrational in a way that uh, uh, former Soviet leaders like Khrushchev and Brezhnev were not. And I won't go into what might happen if he escalates because it's again, speculation about a situation that hasn't happened. But I will conclude by looking at uh, what I think is premature and unwarranted gloating by realists, uh, many of whom are saying, see, we told you so. It's a nasty, anarchic world, and this war just proves it. And how deluded liberals and constructivists are by believing in institutions and norms, none of this matters. What counts is raw muscle. So you can construct a completely opposite narrative that the Russians are failing and they're failing because of stiff Ukrainian resistance and the unity of a West, which was unimaginable before the invasion. And they're failing because uh, Russian soldiers really don't know what they're fighting for, but Ukrainians do. So here, let's turn to Karl Clausewitz, who wisely described war as a contest in wills. Uh, and it's not just how much punishment you can inflict on the other side. It's how much punishment you yourself can absorb. So the Americans and the Soviets won every battle, respectively, in Vietnam and Afghanistan. They lost the wars. And they lost the wars because American and Russian people said enough. And they said enough because they saw no reason why they should be bleeding to impose their will on these countries. Whereas the Vietnamese and Afghanis fighting against them had very strong notions of why this kind of fight was in their minds worth risking their lives. That's what's happening here. Uh, and this stands in the face of these so-called rationalist and realist calculations. But more importantly, if it turns out that the Russians are defeated or compelled to crawl home with their tails behind their legs, it's going to immensely strengthen the norm that territorial aggression is unacceptable that the only use of force that will succeed and that uh, will work is one that is in obvious self-defense or authorized by appropriate international organizations. Uh, if so, uh, then I think it will be liberals and constructivists who will point to Ukraine as more evidence of the significant kinds of changes in international relations, theory, and practice that realists deny. Um, I'll stop here for questions. Exactly a half hour. Thank you, Professor Libo. They're providing us with a different argument. And uh, when I when like I was just thinking that it's a realist argument that is uh, uh, like a burgeoning on over the liberal and the and uh, the constructive, but when you said about that uh, uh, Putin's irrational behavior, even the strategy of Russian uh, uh, soldiers that where they, for what reason they are fighting, but uh, Ukrainian has a, a definitive goal in their minds. So uh, let's, uh, let me take my question on the realist assumption that the international system is anarchic vindicated by Russian invasion of Ukraine and China. I'm just comparing or not contrasting with the Chinese aggression, aggressive posture in, posture in the South China Sea and the Himalayan region. Uh, 
Alternatively, do you think that the war in Ukraine and Chinese belligerence is better explained by cognitive factors like Putin's or Xi's personality or a process of groupthink in each case? Well, I, I, I really don't have time to go into these, these other cases in, at, at great length. Um, it's clear that under uh, Xi Jinping, that China has been behaving more aggressively um, than before. Uh, it's also true that uh, this kind of policy plays very well um, in China where um, educated opinion is intensely nationalist. I mean, we see this uh, from what we read about uh, how Chinese who post on the web have responded to the Ukrainian uh, invasion. Um, on the other hand, uh, ask yourself uh, what lesson uh, Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders will draw uh, if and when the Russian invasion fails. Uh, it, it may uh, make them more cautious rather than embolden them. Uh, this we'll have to wait and see. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And uh, the, my, the next question is like accordance with that, uh, what are the possible ways to terminate the war? Well, uh, the clearest and best way to terminate a war is through diplomacy. And this could take the form of direct negotiations uh, between uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia, which uh, Zelensky has called for, uh, but the Russians um, have really prevented from happening because they've uh, voiced unreasonable demands that he has to accept as the precondition for negotiations. Uh, it's always possible that that uh, Russian position will change as they suffer more losses. Uh, alternatively, you could also have a uh, peace agreement brokered by third parties. So if you consider the Geneva Convention uh, which ended the uh, French uh, war against the Viet Minh in Vietnam, uh, that took place in the context of a wider international negotiation uh, in which other issues uh, came into play. So uh, it may well be, and I don't know the answer here, that just a Russian-Ukrainian negotiation focusing only on Ukraine and Russia is the successful way to go, or alternatively, a much broader uh, framework that addresses security issues in the entire region, not just regarding Ukraine, will be more palatable to the Russians. We don't know the answer. So that's, uh, that's one route, diplomacy. The second route is militarily. Uh, the Russians uh, could, or I think it's less likely now, succeed in capturing Kiev and occupying Ukraine. And unless NATO were prepared to prevent them from doing this, that would put an end to, uh, not to the fighting, because I think there'd be extensive uh, guerrilla warfare that would uh, be carried out against the Russians. But it would... Uh, it, uh, it would, the Russians could claim a military success. Alternatively, the Ukrainians uh, supplied by the West could end up expelling uh, the Russians from their country. That would be also a military solution, but of the opposite kind. And of course, finally, the worst possible outcome is that there is no solution and that the conflict escalates. I'm taking my next question from the chat box. Uh, it's from Dr. Ernest Gunasekra Rockwell. Uh, what role did decades of Western appeasement of Russia, that is lack of response to the 2008 invasion of Georgia, uh, 2014 and annexation of Crimea and the insertion of the little green men into Southern and Eastern Ukraine play in emboldening Putin to 
launch the current invasion? What, well, if anything, I, I, can now be done to remedy this perception of weakness on the part of you and NATO leaders? I'm sorry. Well, that, that's a question that answers, that's set up in the wrong way. It's like asking, are you still beating your wife? Uh, the assumption of the person who asked the question is that the West was appeasing Russia beforehand. And I don't think that's that's the case. Uh, it, it wasn't taking any kind of firm action against uh, Russia because it was um, divided. Uh, it also, Western leaders deluded themselves that Putin's aims um, were limited. Uh, but as I've argued, um, I don't think that this was a critical decision uh, in Putin's uh, decision to go a critical factor in Putin's decision to go to war. Uh, and what he's done, uh, ironically, uh, has um, brought about the very reverse of what he, he sought. We know that he's funded uh, you know, right-wing groups like Marie Le Pen uh, and Orban and done everything in his power to weaken and divide the West. And that's been a long-term strategy on his part. Uh, but now look what's happened. Uh, Germany has reversed itself in the most dramatic way. Uh, the West is unified in a manner it hasn't been before. The Western countries will spend more on their defense. NATO troops are moving into Eastern European countries where they had not been before. Uh, Putin is creating the kind of threat uh, that is, in fact, um, real. So we really have to ask ourselves uh, not only how the West miscalculated, but how Putin miscalculated even more seriously than the West. Thanks, Professor. Um, my next question is also from our consortium members, is uh, Vineet. Uh, he's asking about the alliance. Could alliance be a solution towards ensuring deterrence when it comes to Moscow's belligerence toward NATO members? Well, that, like, once again, the assumption here is that deterrence works and is uh, an effective strategy. And I, I don't buy that. Now, I think that it certainly makes sense to try to practice deterrence, but it has to be embedded, as I've argued elsewhere, in a strategy that also makes use of reassurance and diplomacy uh, to address the wider causes of, uh, of conflict. So deterrence by itself uh, doesn't do you very much. Thanks, Professor. Uh, I would like to have your insight on the Mies same as argument that uh, in The Economist and The New Yorker that uh, he said NATO and the US are to blame for the war. Yeah, well, let, let me say this. Uh, as I said, John is my former student. John is a friend. Uh, he is a very nice man, lovely person. However, anything he's ever said about international relations is wrong. And this is only the latest example. Uh, you may remember, uh, some of you, that at, when the Cold War ended, uh, he predicted that NATO would collapse within two or three years, that Germany and France and other Western countries would be at each other's throats, that the only way Germany and Japan could look after their security was by acquiring nuclear arsenals, which he urged them to do. Uh, he further argued with Steve Walt the absurd uh, uh, claim that the Iraq war was brought about by the American Jewish lobby. Uh, this is just more nonsense. Uh, and it's gotten play for reasons that have nothing whatsoever to do with the uh, uh, logic or empirical evidence uh, behind his argument. And fundamentally, the argument rests on the belief that Putin is purely opportunity driven and that by the West, uh, 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 either failing to practice deterrence, it gave him the opportunity to do so. And here he argues out of both sides of his mouth, because he also argues that by extending NATO to the West, that it created the need for Putin to do it. And I've already argued uh, 
uh, against both of those claims. Okay, thanks. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Tekin, if you want to ask a question. All right, Ned, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, there is uh, some talk about Russia possibly using some tactical, tactical nukes um, or, you know, uh, regular uh, nuclear weapons. Now, we know that you are an expert on perceptions, misperceptions, <laughs> and uh, nuclear strategies. I was wondering um, how you see the topic of Russia or, well, pretty much Putin pushing on the button for the full-scale uh, nuclear attack or some sort of tactical uh, nuclear attack. What is your take on that? So I, I, I think today in The Guardian that uh, Ivo Dalda had a very thoughtful piece looking at the possible steps of Russian escalation. And these included or started with the use of either chemical or biological weapons in Ukraine. Uh, another possibility was the use of tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. A third was some kind of limited attack against uh, NATO, meaning presumably the air bases in Poland and Romania that are used to supply weapons to Ukrainian forces. Um, he thought that Putin was the kind of leader who uh, would not dismiss such options out of hand, and all the more so if he appeared to be losing the war. And his question was not whether Putin would do this, but how the West should respond. And again, none of us know whether Putin will do this or if the Russian military will follow his orders to do so. So we do know in the case of the United States that when Donald Trump was president, the Joint Chiefs uh, were very worried that Trump would do something irrational and destructive. Orders went out to the unified and specified commanders. In other words, the uh, generals and admirals at the top levels of command, that if they received orders from Trump to go on alert or to use weapons, that they should uh, not act on them but immediately inform the Joint Chiefs of Staff and should undertake no preparations or actions uh, in the absence of receiving direct confirming orders from the Joint Chiefs. Uh, one would like to think that there are some Russian generals who are also cautious, who uh, love their country, who don't want to see it destroyed or see it dragged into a war that they cannot lose. Now, unlike the United States, where the Joint Chiefs, although appointed by the president, um, have some degree of independent standing and authority, that's not true in Russia, where the top levels of military command are all people who have been handpicked by Putin. So those folks um, are likely to obey him, but it's uh, officers of lower rank down the chain of command who would have to implement uh, what he orders. And here there may be some resistance. Um, it's also true if we come to nuclear weapons that the Russians have um, uh, in some ways a more effective command and control uh, procedure than does the West. In the United States, it's the military that command both the warheads and the delivery systems. In Russia, or well, in the Soviet Union, it used to be the military control the delivery systems and the KGB, the weapons, and the two could only be married up when each received orders to do so through independent chains of command and communication, and then compared their notes and had the same codes. 
presumably that's still true uh, in Russia. And it creates the possibility where lower down the chain of command, uh, people just won't carry orders out. Uh, so uh, we don't know. We don't know and we don't know uh, if we have to rely on people to do this because Putin himself uh, has no constraints. It's a frightening situation. Do you, do you have anything to add? Well, you know, yes, um, it, it makes a lot of sense actually that uh, the Russian military might, might uh, just disobey the orders as you might, uh, you know, read also, you know, some of the guys are missing, the top guys are not uh, making any uh, sort of, uh, uh, not giving any pictures uh, to the media, etc. So it seems that uh, probably already there are some, uh, you know, resistance within the Russian state uh, against uh, Putin. Uh, I would say this is a good sign, actually. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And you also, um, in, in this connection, I should remember that if we look at uh, coups, military coups around the world, uh, most often carried out by colonels. Yeah. Because the colonels know the people at the top, but at the same time, they're in command of the troops and they know the people down the chain of command. Uh, and it may be that that's the group in Russia who we ultimately have to hope will come to their senses and act. And of course, all of this could uh, presumably readily be uh, dealt with uh, if Putin were removed. Well, the West would uh, welcome the fiction that this was Putin's war. Yes. And, and agree to negotiate with a new Russian leadership of any kind uh, on the basis of a full withdrawal from Ukraine. Right. Thanks, um, Professor. I would like to take uh, the, your brief insight on uh, the two questions that are in the chat box. Uh, how will Sino-US relations change depending on China's response or reactions to Russia's decision-making with regards to Ukraine? Okay, let me answer that. Um, in the first place, I don't think the US has handled this well. Uh, you know, Biden is a natural hawk and he's surrounded by a national security advisor and secretary of state who think the same way, who are busy making public threats that China will pay a huge price if it supports Russia. Uh, that has the effect of driving it into Russia's arms. Uh, what they should be doing is keeping their mouths shut publicly and communicating quietly to China and making a different kind of argument, to wit that China wants to exercise a powerful role in the world. This is its opportunity. It's the third party in this conflict. It should use its good offices to make clear to Putin that it won't support it and that the Russians will pay a big price for doing it. Uh, that kind of positive incentive rather than negative threats is far more likely uh, to convince the Chinese to do what Washington wants. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Professor. That, uh, and uh, the last question I would like to take here about the humanitarian corridor uh, and the re Russian aggression on the, on the humanitarian corridors. And uh, uh, um, uh, is there any window of addressing Russia's security concerns vis-a-vis -vis the West NATO uh, by by proposing that Russia itself could become a member with Article 5 protections? Uh, this is a question from the chat. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think offering Russia membership in NATO at this point is, is really a non-starter. It would have to be a different Russia. Thanks uh, for your uh, insight. Uh, I would like you to just... Uh,
my last question from the my list like i want to know your insight about uh, the uh, countries or the state who are dependent on russia's like you mentioned the germany's dependency on russia's uh, energy and gas and if india is dependent on russian arms and ammunition so how the credibility of uh, india is impacting so india in, is behaving very badly and i must say i find india's uh, current leader uh, as bad as uh, orban and uh, 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 these other right-wing nationalist dictators uh, acting in ways which are contrary to the country's real interest uh, and uh, the tacit Indian support for Russia in the long run is not going to play very well. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank you for uh, like uh, your insight. Uh, there's a, another question. One last question I would like to say. Is this really the last question? Because yeah, this is the really times. last big. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's in the chat box. I'm thinking that he wants to know something about social science view. Both NATO and Russia is responsible for this war. If if NATO not back and then Ukraine never raised arms. There is no space. I'm sorry. I, I don't understand the question. Yeah, it's 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 a kind of uh, it's not uh, uh, the question is not framed very in a very well mannered. Yes. I'm sorry. The last UN company. That, that's all right. All right. Uh, well, it's been it's been a pleasure uh, addressing you all, and I wish you well. And I hope when the pandemic is over, that some of us at least our paths cross in person. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor, for your time, and uh, thank you, audience, for your support. Uh, I uh, I'm happy to see you again at our event. Uh, thank you, Professor, once again. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Goodbye, man. everyone. Thank you, Inda. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye-bye, Professor.